We're looking at five must draft running backs in fantasy football if you completely fade the running back position for the first five, six rounds of your draft. So I think there's this common misconception in fantasy football that like if you start your draft off going super heavy at one position, like say you go zero running back right? and you take three wide receivers, a tight end, a quarterback in the first five rounds, you got no running backs by the time you hit round six or vice versa. Same thing with wide receivers that like the position that you haven't drafted yet the guys that you should target in those ranges should be like high upside dudes dudes that could be like league winners because if they do hit your team is going to be stacked the way i look at it is completely the opposite of that your team by the time you get to like round six should be really really stacked at the positions that you drafted and by the time you get there, you have made up already the majority of the points that your team is going to have. By the time, if I'm in round six or seven and I have not drafted a running back yet, I'm not trying to draft a guy that I subjectively think is talented that might jump over like one or two guys in the backfield on the chance that he has upside. I'm looking for dudes that I know are getting 10 to 12 touches per game in an average to above average offense. Like give me those eight, 10, 11 fantasy points per week in the positions that are not premium or in the rounds that are not premium. And I'm, that's me all fantasy season. Okay. Your first four to five picks in any fantasy draft are going to do the majority of the heavy lifting for you. Okay. If you look at ADP and you look at average PPR points per players picked at these ADP spots. And there's obviously a lot of nuance to it. You can look at half PPR and per position per year, things change. But on average, your first four picks, depending on how many starting lineup uh, positions you have in your lineup are going to make up, I don't know, 36, 38, 40% of your starting lineup in terms of just people in your roster. But that's going to produce like 65 to 70% of the weekly fantasy points that you put up on your team. And of course, every year there are going to be dudes in like the sixth, seventh, ninth round that go crazy, could be league winners, but you're not good at predicting those. Nobody is. There's a reason that they go in the ninth round because literally everyone, the entirety of the fantasy football market has them pegged as ninth round players. Otherwise, they would be drafted earlier. So when I get into those rounds, when I fade a specific position early on, I'm looking for dudes that have very clear defined roles, not like the hopefully this guy hits a ceiling of maybe getting 12 to 14. Like, I'm not trying to play the what if game here. I'm trying to play the this shit is happening and it's going straight into my lineup game. The highest correlation in terms of fantasy success as it relates to running backs is pure volume. It's just touches. We know this. As you go down the draft, the projections for specific rounds and players as, uh, as it relates to like what we project them to produce fantasy points per game wise gets lower and lower and lower. So we want to at least account for one side of the equation, efficiency or volume. If we know someone's going to get a lot of volume, that is the highest correlated piece of information we can get for a fantasy player. All right. So that's a long winded intro. You know what to do. Tuck them shirts in. Flex your traps. Stop yelling. <laughs> Also, actually, before we get into running back number one, uh, we started a trivia channel, like a YouTube channel for fantasy and NFL trivia that's way less serious and a lot more fun within the office. And we put out YouTube videos like three, four times a week. Really, really popular right now, growing really, really fast. So if you're into that thing, you just want something to relax to and play some trivia with us, go check that channel out. I will link it first link in the description down below. So this list is comprised of dudes that are outside of the first six rounds, right? It's, it's easy to grab dudes and talk about dudes within the first six rounds. So this cuts out dudes like... Dalvin Cook, Cam Akers, Rashad White, James Conner, Alexander Madison, even DeAndre Swift, Isaiah Pacheco, okay? So it's only dudes in round seven per ADP or later. And the very first dude on this list, I cannot believe he's going this late, but it's David Montgomery of the Detroit Lions, currently the first pick in the seventh round, RB28. Despite how you feel about Jameer Gibbs, his draft capital, how talented he was at Alabama, the Detroit Lions have been crystal clear as a football team headed by Dan Campbell, about the type of football they want to play. It's hard nose, grind it out, it's get in your face, hit you in the chest type beat. You look no further than Jamal Williams last year. He led running backs in red zone carries, in 10 zone carries, in goal line carries, in rushing touchdowns. Now, no one in their sound mind is going to try to convince you that David Montgomery is going to be in line for 17 rushing touchdowns this year, but I also don't think anyone in their sound mind would argue that Jamal Williams is a better running back than David Montgomery. 
obviously the personnel there in Detroit's a little bit different. Like Swift is out the door. Jamal Williams is gone. Jameer Gibbs comes in. So they will be doing some different things and probably have different looks in the backfield. But it's been very clear, like, the personnel and the type of football team that they want to be. And I can't remember who tweeted or where I saw it, so I can't pull it up. But someone threw out some info about Jameer Gibbs and the number of goal line carries he had at Alabama and the number of carries he had that were inside the tackles or guards at Alabama. It was like a strikingly low number. Just to say, in those short down situations, probably by the goal line, he's not going to be the guy on the field. But I also think we're probably underestimating just how much better David Montgomery is than Jamal Williams from a pure running back standpoint. This is really going to be the first year, I think, that we get to see David Montgomery operate in like a good offense. I know the Bears made the playoffs in 2020. They were like eight and eight. And even in that year, DeMont went for 1,500 yards from scrimmage and 10 touchdowns. But we look at last year's numbers comparing David Montgomery to Jamal Williams as just a pure running back. If you look at pretty much any elusiveness rating on any given site, avoided tackles per attempt, juke rate, Montgomery was top 10. Jamal Williams was so far out of the top starting running backs in the NFL. Yards after contact per attempt, this was the only thing I would expect Jamal Williams to be able to top David Montgomery, in, but he did not do that. Montgomery was 21st, Jamal Williams 25th. And then again, every receiving category, David Montgomery blows him the fuck out of the water, okay? We know that DeMont can contribute at a much higher level than Jamal Williams can on third downs in pass catching situations. Like if you look among the top 35 fantasy running backs last year, top 35, Jamal Williams finishes like the RB8. Jamal Williams had the single fewest targets, receptions, and receiving yards out of any top 35 fantasy running back. I'm just saying like DeMont is in my mind a lock to see 200 touches. I don't think that's out of the realm of possibilities whatsoever and scoring eight touchdowns this year. We thought Jamal Williams had 17 rushing touchdowns. I I, I don't even, I'm not even going to project him for like 13 or 12 or 11. I think like eight, nine, 10 is really, really realistic. You give someone 200 touches and eight, nine, 10 touchdowns, they're going to return value on their running back 28 ADP. So DeMont is like the easiest pick in the seventh round of fantasy drafts right now in my opinion if you have foregone the running back position number two on this list is a denver bronco and you might be thinking javante williams but no he would fall into the category of shooting for upside with unnecessary risk it's samaja p ryan 903 right now rb 35 now the most obvious point to be made here is that javante williams is more than likely going to have a J.K. Dobbins type year. And I've been saying this for a long time, and this tweet just kind of backs it up. And I've learned a lot from Dr. Jesse Morris. He used to come on the channel a lot. And this idea that I had came before I even saw this tweet, but we're clearly on the same uh, wavelength, especially considered this tweet came out four days ago. And I've been saying this for like two months now, but his tweet says, Javante Williams suffered a significant knee injury on October 2nd, 2022. He reportedly tore his ACL, LCL, and posterior lateral corner in his right knee. In terms of comparing severity of ACL tears, this is one of the worst. This is similar to J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards's. J.K. only had one game with 10-plus fantasy points over his first 13 games. Whatever. You get the point. Um, Javante Williams did not have a clean ACL tear. He had many different tears within the knee, which means those other tears, the swelling, they either need to get worked on first or the swelling needs to go down in order for you to be able to repair the other parts of the knee and what that means is the return timetable that everyone likes to mark the 9 to 12 month mark and then say oh that's the first week of the season if you have to let the swelling go down for a time being that pushes the surgery back which means the 9 to 12 month mark also kind of becomes 10 to 13 months you know what I mean so that's the other thing and most athletes are not 100% back mentally by the next year so he feels like he's going down the JK Dobbins path and I would almost look at the situation like imagine going into last year right all the throughout the J.K. Dobbins reports were terrible. If Gus Edwards had never tore his ACL the year prior with Dobbins and Gus Edwards was a good pass catching back, that is like how we would be looking at Samaj P. Ryan, how you should be looking at Samaj P. Ryan last year. Like imagine going into last year, Gus Edwards was fully healthy and a good pass catching back. We would have been drafting very, very highly. Now, I don't actually think Samaj P. Ryan's better than Joe Mixon as a running back, but he was pretty much better than him in every single like running back efficiency metric on a per carry per touch basis and you look at behind Javante Williams like there's no one else on the depth chart it's like Tyler Batty and it's Tony Jones and it's like guys you've never heard of before now I have no idea if Javante is actually going to miss time or not I think there's a chance he plays in week one I think there's a chance he starts the year on the pup list it's kind of like up for grabs right now the range of spec the outcome for where he might end up being on the field and useful for Denver is a very very wide range regardless I expect as do all the beat reporters out in Denver expect P. Ryan to be extremely involved in this offense and we have Sean Payton coming in who has been like a dynamo in terms of getting his running backs involved in the passing game the other cool thing about like Samaj P. Ryan 
if you're a team that has gone really wide receiver, tight end, pass catcher, quarterback heavy, and he's one of your first running backs on your team, he is like the perfect zero running back type of candidate because you feel really good about him producing and having a large role within the first four to eight weeks of the season. And that is like prime time to be scouring the waiver wire for pickups. So by the time Samaje might be irrelevant or by the time Javante comes back and like plays a big role in this offense or maybe becomes the guy we want him to be, I don't even know if that's going to happen this year. You'll probably have targeted dudes on the waiver wire that you can supplement Samaje P. Ryan with. So it's not like week one, it's like, oh no, he's not involved. We need to find someone right away. You have a good, I think, four, six, eight weeks before you really, really Really need to find a replacement for Samaje P. Ryan. Third, Khalil Herbert, Chicago Bears, currently going off the 905 running back 36. And I want to plug something else really quickly. It's our draft weekend coming at the end of August. We actually just had uh, one person drop out, so we need to fill this last spot for it. It is such a fucking fun weekend. We bring you guys out to New York City. We bring 11 of you guys out. You compete in a fantasy league with me. We do a live draft in the BDGE headquarter office. We get an awesome Airbnb for the weekend. We kind of party the rest of the weekend. We talk, we hang out, we do trivias for TikTok, etc. This is kind of a synopsis of it. You could pause it and read it by yourself. It is August 25th to August 27th, which is the weekend before Labor Day weekend. You obviously have to be in New York City. You don't have to be located here, but you have to be able to travel here. Uh, this is an expensive trip. I'll just be straight up with you guys. It is $2,000 a person, which is all inclusive. That covers everything for the weekend, as well as the $250 league buy-in going out transportation within the city, but you have to be able to get here by yourself. That does not pay for the actual transportation to get to New York City. But if you can get here, that pays for the all-inclusivity of New York City for a wonderful fucking weekend. So we need one person. If you are interested, please email business at bdge.co, okay? You have to be available that weekend, August 25th to 27th. Don't reach out and then a week later tell me that you're not available anymore. Two, you have to be willing to pay that price, obviously. So if that's too much for you, that's fine. We're not looking for, this is not open to everybody. This is open to our most intense fans at BDG. We want to get to know you and hang out with you for the weekend. And I want to get to know and hang out with Khalil Herbert for the NFL season. Ninth round pick, running back 36. So he's one running back behind Samaj P. Ryan, all right? So everyone, there's like the narrative that like everyone thinks that Justin Fields is going to stink this year because the Bears just run the ball so much and they never throw the ball and they don't trust him to throw the ball. And they, and they run it 82% of the time, but nobody wants the best running back on the team. They have a better offensive line. They have a better offense, which will lead to more scoring opportunities. They have already shown the propensity to give Khalil Herbert a workhorse load. Like when DeMont was out for four weeks last year, he averaged over 20 opportunities per game. That's not a joke, right? That's not like 14 touches per game. It's not 15. It's over 20 opportunities per game. He was the workhorse. And obviously on a limited touch count, but in his career, year over year, every year he's been in the NFL so far, he has been among the top 10, top five running backs, efficiency-wise, per touch basis. True yards per carry, yards created, juke rate, like all of it is really, really... that He was a guy like that in college, too. I remember being really, really high on him coming out of college. He was a late uh, a late guy. I think he played five years in college. He transferred to Vatech before coming out. But even watching him and looking at the actual numbers coming out of college, he's always been this type of elusive runner. He's always been... A bigger size dude, but really, really smooth for his size. And that translates really well to the NFL. Now, he's receiving first-team reps at OTAs already. I'm not really looking too much into that because both of the other running backs, Roshan Johnson and Deonta Foreman, are new to the team. So, of course, they're not just going to give those guys first crack at it. But I think Roshan Johnson's kind of overrated just as a, a fantasy player. He'll probably come in here and there for the team, but it'll probably be a shift of Herbert and Deonta Foreman kind of splitting carries there. I think Clear Herbert's like a really talented really efficient running back that is the starting running back in an offense that is ascending and going to be decently good this year. So uh, I really, really like Herbert in the ninth, 10th round as someone that I think could end up with like 230, 240 carries this year that you're getting super, super late in drafts. And I've talked about the fourth guy on this list ad nauseum. All right. It's Jarek McKinnon, the 1105 RB 42. I still can't believe he's going outside of the, the the first fucking 11 rounds. It's kind of like the opposite of David Montgomery or the opposite of a lot of these fucking grinders in that we know his role is super clear and it's not as the grinder. It's not as the early down guy. He's the third down back. He catches all the passes. And I've, I've told you guys this stat fucking 230 times already because I think it's really interesting. But last year, inside the 10-yard line, Mahomes led the NFL by far with the most pass attempts inside the 10-yard line. McKinnon had 11 targets of Mahomes' 71. That's like a 20% target share down there. Pacheco had zero. On third downs, McKinnon had 
21 targets. Pacheco had zero. Like it's a very clear defined role for McKinnon and it might come with some inconsistency, but I'm not worried about inconsistency as it relates to a guy who's my RB2, my flex in my lineup. I just want some spike weeks, some seven point games is fine with me if I have the first six, seven guys cemented on my roster that are producing at a very high level. And I mean, you look at the Chiefs offense, I, it still fucking amazes me how they won the, the Super Bowl last year. Juju's not there anymore. McCall Hardman's not there anymore. They somehow actually have fewer targets to throw the ball to than they did last year after having one of the worst receiving cores in the NFL like crazy. They throw the ball like crazy. They throw the ball like crazy when and where it matters on the football field. And because they're a really good offense, they are on the football field a lot. So low volume, Jarek McKinnon is still medium volume because of the amount of volume that this team has and the amount of volume that this team throws the ball. And that is his very clear defined role. So I love Jarek McKinnon down here at the 11.05. I think there are some other ones. I'll kind of lump this fifth one into a quick synopsis of dudes that I feel like are honorable mentions. I still feel like Alvin Kamara at the end of the seventh, eighth round is still a good bet if you're drafting right now in like best ball. These legal things, we never have any idea. They just can, they seem to continue to get pushed year after year after year. This always happens. And the suspension is typically way smaller than we expect it to be. Um, unless it's something like really severe, like Deshaun Watson's obviously, but like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the more, the more we don't hear about it, the more I feel a little bit more comfortable. And I've learned, I've been in this industry long enough to know that like no one in the fantasy industry has any fucking idea what they're talking about as it relates to legal things. But we have seen most of these things feel like they become such a big blip on the radar and you expect these huge things to happen. And it, it rarely happens um, as it relates to the case that Alvin Kamara is dealing with right now, right? Like we've seen an influx of these other crate, like domestic violence is becoming probably a little bit more focused on with the NFL. The gambling thing is obviously becoming a massive problem, but these types of things, violence or assault or whatever, don't tend to be overly scrutinized by the NFL, especially not these star players. So like if Alvin Kamara is playing, I love Kendra Miller. Like if Kamara gets suspended, I think Kendra Miller could break out all over the place. But if Kamara's playing, he's a starting running back there, right? And Derek Carr is way more usable than most of the quarterbacks that they've had in New Orleans since um, Drew Brees has left. So I, I really like Kamara where he's going right now. And then I was like trying to make a case for either the Washington running backs, and I'm having such a hard time doing so. Like they were both so inefficient on the ground. We have a new OC. They're comparing fucking Antonio Gibson to Danian Tomlinson and Martian, Marshall Falk for like the fucking fourth year in a row. It's just all they do is lie. All they It's dripped down the culture. Even though Snyder's out of there, all they do is lie. They have just cemented that type of behavior in there, and you never know what you're getting. And then they add Chris Rodriguez into the mix, who's like the same thing as Brian Robinson. Does he get carries? I really don't know. I like Gibson a lot more than I like Brian Robinson, given that he's going like two to three rounds later than Brian Robinson is. And we know that he's really the only pass catching running back in that backfield. And there's no more JD McKissick there. So I like Gibson as well. Rashad Penny is a guy that feels a little risky to me. Would I bet on him not making the team? No, but that wouldn't surprise me if he got cut. So he's again, a guy that like, I don't feel comfortable whatsoever. If he gets a total of 70 carries this year, 70 touches this year, for one reason or another, gets cut, gets hurt, gets uh, fucking ostracized in the backfield. Kenny Gainwell, Boston Scott, and DeAndre Swift get more touches. Like, none of that would surprise me in the slightest, okay? So does Penny have some upside? Yeah, maybe, but he's not a dude that I'm, like, trying to rely on for my RB1 or 2 slots. And that's kind of it. I, th I think the selection of dudes in, like, the 5th, 6th round are are probably still considerable for 0 RB. Like, if you use the first 3-4 picks on other guys, you could still get some really quality guys like J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, and stuff in the 5th. But this is the selection I'm looking at if I completely fade running back all the way into, like, the 6th, 7th, 8th round. I think they give you a really solid, like, security blanket of, double digit touches, you know, Dave Montgomery, some of these guys being in good offenses that you know will have enough volume for them to give you some fantasy points. So those are the guys I like. Who do y'all like? If you're fading running backs, let me know in the comment section and make sure you subscribe to the channel because we are doing this same exact video for wide receivers and we're going to do it for tight ends as well. So I'll leave you with that. Two other things, subscribe to the trivia channel, link down below, email business at bdge.co if you are interested in attending the BDGE NYC draft weekend. If you've never been to New York, this is uh, quite the intro for you. All right. I love you. I'm out of here.